whereabouts of Bedford, West Virginia, they tell stories. They say that at midnight, under every full moon, the ghost of Earl Joe Hendershot drives his kill car right up out of the ground and runs a spectral race down the notorious stretch of road they call Crooked Neck. Lurleen Stokes thought that was all bullshit. Yet, she still found herself riding out to the end of Crooked Neck most every midnight, full moon or not. Just to sit and watch. Just to make sure. On this night, Lurleen found another car waiting. And this was right where Crooked Neck intersects with the paved highway. The very spot where they buried that old murderous son of a bitch ghost Earl Joe. It was not a popular spot. So that someone was waiting here, now, implied they were waiting for Lurleen. She pulled up in her rebuilt Cutlass Supreme revving the custom engine and went grill to grill with that other car until metal tinged against metal. The driver of this other car held up empty hands and then cut her engine and stepped out onto the pavement. It was a middle-aged woman, a cowgirl in scuffed leather boots and a sensible ponytail. She had a pistol snuggled up under her arm like it lived there. She didn't look like the law, exactly, but she did look like she meant business. Miss Stokes, the cowgirl said. Lurleen revved her engine once for yes. You mind stepping out so we can talk? Lurleen revved the engine twice for no. I want to hire you, Miss Stokes, as a driver. I've got a unique situation on my hands, and I need a woman with your unique experience. Lurleen let the engine purr, waiting for more. You're the one buried the kill car. You think you're up to handling something along those lines again? Lurleen rolled down her window. Go on then, say your piece. The cowgirl said, Have you ever heard the story of the Southern Gentleman? Of course. Well, my boss at the DRO... He's got a thing for the gentleman, and he aims to catch him. Moreover, he aims for me to catch him. I think you can help me. Lurleen cut the lights and the engine so that they could talk. The cowgirl extended her hand. Name's Lefty, and I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music, monsters, and mayhem, killers, cannibals, and cults, fearful fiction and furious fact, tall tales, and terrible truths. This is a scary home companion. Lurleen was driving. Lefty was monologuing. You see, there are two different things people can be talking about when they talk about the Southern Gentleman. The first is, of course, the original legend. That little slice of Gothic Americana, which, you may not know, dates back to the first road system in this country. 
before there were cars or trains? When the only mass transit on land was being pulled by horses? Already, the stories about him were starting to spread. The gentleman was very charming, exceedingly polite. And anyone who picked him up would likely not live to see the next morning. There are hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds upon hundreds of reported sightings of the Southern gentleman over the last 200 years. I've seen stacks of reports. He's one of the South's most enduring legends. And inspired by him, there is another, a man who calls himself the Southern gentleman. But he's a serial killer, a hitchhiker who attacks, wounds, kills any drivers who pick him up just to cause horrific accidents. And this maniac has evaded capture for nigh on 30 years. They think he's never going to be caught. But what if these two things weren't different at all? What if this man, this serial killing drifter, was the same one who'd been terrorizing the highways since the 1800s? Lurleen wasn't listening anymore. She was watching something. Lefty tracked her gaze, saw the police cruiser. Oh, she sighed. It ain't gonna work, Lurleen. The hell you say, Lurleen replied. I'm telling you, it ain't gonna work. Lurleen pulled a strand of hair out of her eyes. Code crimson my ass. They were on a divided four lane, about an hour's ride north of Memphis, pushing a hundred in a modified 1977 Pontiac Trans Am. And you know it was painted bandit black. Lurleen had her sights set on a police cruiser. It was coming up just on their right. It was a muscly, new model Mustang, rolling at about 70. And the cop behind the wheel, he was definitely keeping it leashed at that speed. It was perfect. Lurleen slowed down and pulled up right alongside the state trooper. He looked over at him. Lefty obliged her partner by rolling down the window so that the trooper could clearly see Lurleen flipping him off. Lefty gave the guy a look, a sort of half shrug, like, what are you going to do? And then Lurleen stomped metal, surged forward, and left that cruiser behind like it was standing still. Then the red and blues blazed, the sirens wailed, the Mustang came alive and roared after them. For about a quarter mile, at which point the cop didn't just slow down, He slammed on the brakes, cut the lights, cut the sirens, came to a complete dead stop in the middle of the highway. Lefty cluck. I told you it wasn't going to work. Lurleen ground gears. The engine smoke and the smell of scorched oil settled her. Listen, the faster we get this piece of business wrapped up, the faster you can go back to a genuine threat of going to jail, okay? The driver snorted. She downshifted. All right. So what are you saying we're after then? Is it a serial or a ghost? I'm fine either way, truth be told, but which is it? Lefty said, well, can't say. 
There's this, though, merits mention. Anyone who has ever met the man face to face and lived to drive another day, they all say the same thing. That he's the god of the roads. Connected to them. In some way that I surely don't understand. He eats roadkill from the ditch. He drinks from puddles of oil and water on the pavement. He breathes exhausts. He listens to the song of the road. He hears its voice speaking to him when he lays his ear against it. They say that truckers should carry a St. Christopher's medal because it wards off the gentleman, but others say that nothing can save you and that he collects those St. Christopher medals as trophies. If the road system here in America is the circulatory system of the country, then the cars and the trucks and the vehicles and the drivers, that's the blood. And the gentleman, he feasts on that blood. Huh, Lurleen said. And you believe that? Well, I believe that my boss wants him to be caught. Bullshit, woman. No sale. You got thoughts up in there. I can feel it. So let's hear them. Lefty said, okay. You really want to know? This is what I think. The gentleman, he's not the god of the roads. But I think that he's bound to them. He's trapped here. He wants to go, but he can't. I don't know why, and I know that it doesn't make sense. But I think that he wants to die. And that these wrecks, all this death, he's not really trying to kill people. He's just trying to kill himself. And this is the only means he has to do it. But, The roads won't let him die. So what is he then, Lefty? A ghost? A zombie? A fucking Highlander? Lefty sighed. What did I just say? I know it doesn't make sense, Lurleen. Hell, this is Stephen King country, and I'm just a Louis L'Amour girl. They drove for days and nights. Lurleen at the wheel, always at the wheel. Lefty riding shotgun. The silences were long, but comfortable. Lurleen was never happier than when she was driving. Lefty studied the roads, but she would also take little cat naps here or there, or read from the battered old western dime novel she always kept in her pocket. They stopped often, for food, for beer, for fuel, but mostly so that Lefty could ask questions. She was on the hunt, casting a wide net, talking to everybody that she could, checking in with phone messages to her boss every night. 20 miles west of Tupelo, they stopped at a juke joint right after the sun had dropped down behind the edge of the world. Lefty walked the parking lot, called the home office. This DRO office has been discontinued. Please direct your... She left her field report, which was still, once again, goose eggs. 
Lurleen popped the trunk and switched out her feet while leaning against the back bumper. Lurleen had two different prosthetic feet used for different occasions. The way she said it, there was a driving foot and a drinking foot, which might also be called a dancing foot or a fighting foot, depending on her disposition at the time. The driving foot was light, responsive, custom fit to lock into the custom pedals of her car. The drinking foot was bigger, sturdier, heavier, with a steel toe. They went inside the bar. The crowd was straight Mississippi garbage. Orange vests and raggedy ball caps wall to wall. Based on the poor selection of vehicles in the parking lot, and the dire state of these rural some bitches in here, there wasn't a soul around worth racing or fucking. But maybe there was a fight to be had. You see, Lurleen and bar fights had an on-again, off-again love affair that went back for years. She ordered shots with beer backs and then went to see about the unhealthy excuse for country music that was playing on the jukebox. Lefty knew from experience that the window of opportunity for friendly conversation was about to slide closed. So she quickly paid for Lurleen's drinks and went through all her standard questions with the old man tending bar. The barkeep talked to her, but he kept his eyes locked on Lurleen. As a man with decades of experience, he knew trouble when he saw it. Lefty recaptured his attention with more money on the bar. Hey, listen up. And then she asked him again. But then the music went dead. The silence was shocking in its abruptness. And then the 40 or 50 murmuring people also went silent as they turned to stare at Lurleen, who was still proudly holding the power cord for the jukebox in her hand. They stared at her, and she stared right back. You're welcome, she said. Finally, she leaned down and plugged the juke back in, and then went to make a selection. Wait a second. They don't have Dolly Parton. What kind of southern bar doesn't have Dolly? Lefty called out to her through the silence. They got any Bobby Gentry? Lurleen looked, and with a shrug, put on Mississippi Delta. Lefty managed to wrestle the barkeep's attention back once again with more money on the bar. She repeated herself, Have you seen him? The old man picked up the money before shaking his head no. Nah. I know you mean, though. Some fella came through year ago past, maybe two. Asking about the same gentleman. Damn it. Ten minutes later, they were both driving away, sore as hell. Lefty was sore because now she knew her boss had already been to this stretch of road, and that meant that the gentleman wouldn't be here. Those two men had cultivated a rivalry over the last ten years or so. Every time they butted heads, it had ended up in bloodshed, and the gentleman had always gotten away. Now, he developed a sense about his enemy in the DRO, so the gentleman would stay far away from anywhere that Bill Handel had been looking for. 
Lurleen, well, she was sore for the much more obvious reason, because of that stiff left hook she took to the kisser. Her cheek was looking a mite purple, and she was gently wiggling each of her teeth to make sure that they weren't loose. She sure hit hard for an old lady. Lurleen marveled at it. She must have been, what, 70? Blue hair perm? The whole shooting match. Lefty said, I'm sort of surprised you didn't hit her back. Well, I thought about it. She reminded me of my mama a little bit, so I gave her a pass. Lefty said, she had a big old wad of chew in that bottom lip, didn't she? It was dip. And yeah, that's just what reminded me of Mama. Mama always had in a big fat lipper. Did you know that dip has twice the level of carcinogens in it that cigarettes do? I read that somewhere, at one of her appointments. Her lip turned on her after a while and just started falling right off her face. It was disgusting. No shit. What did she do? Well, she started using her top lip for dipping. They rode silent for a while until they found another bar, another place to ask questions. <laughs> They were traveling east on a four lane, somewhere in the messy web of highways and back roads in between Boonville and Muscle Shoals. No music, like usual. Lurleen listened to the roar of the engine and let it speak to her. Lefty kept her book in her pocket. No reading tonight, no catnaps, no zoning out. She was on the hunt, and the prey was close. Over the last two days, they had found three different spots on the map with people who had seen the gentleman. She'd checked, and there hadn't been any fatalities or major car accidents in the area, but people had seen the gentleman along the roadside, looking for a lift. As the sun set, Lefty started to jaw. So, the Feely Crowder Company was this high-end stagecoach business. Operated out of Atlanta, 1880s thereabouts. One night, they were out traveling past dusk, and they saw the southern gentleman on the side of the road. The driver and the shotgun, well... They weren't going to stop, of course. But the client insisted. She was an upper-class lady. Didn't believe in those old spook stories. So she made them stop, and the gentleman politely accepted the ride. The next morning comes, and a search party finds the coach. The driver and the shotgun, both dead. But the lady survived. Her neck was broke from the accident, arms and legs totally paralyzed, helpless. She said that the gentleman had sat with her until daybreak to make sure that nothing bad happened to her. 
because she had survived him, he honored her life. What do you think about that? Ahead of them, on the dark and lonely stretch of road, was a rig. A car carrier, full to the brim. It swerved a little as they approached it. And then the CB radio on Lurleen's dash crackled and lit up yellow. Lefty answered the handle. Is this the southern gentleman? Pleased to have your company, ma'am. He paused. I hear you've been looking for me. Well, you found me. The rig ahead of them swerved, crossing the line a little too fast, and Lurleen tapped the brakes to fall behind it. Lefty said, Is that you, Shug? I was hoping you would take a ride with me. The gentleman responded, I hope that's an open invitation. Lurleen whispered, What's the play? Do we just follow him? No, we need to get him stopped. There's not much I can do against something that size, Lefty. Lurleen swerved back and forth, but the car carrier kept drifting. It wasn't letting her edge by. It was only then that Lefty saw him. The southern gentleman, standing up on top of the car carrier. And then he was releasing one of the cars, and it was dropping right down on top of them. The sedan hit the pavement right on the nose, flipping end over end. Lurleen veered left, hard, but smooth, and it whipped past them, shattering glass and twisting metal, missing the front bumper of the Trans Am by inches. Lurleen asked, Who the hell is driving? Lefty answered, Oh, the gentleman never drives. And then he was cutting loose another car, this a Toyota pickup, and Lurleen pulled hard right to get around it. Then came the next one, and the next. He was sending the cars out one after the other, throwing them at Lurleen's Trans Am. And Lurleen whooped. She pounded her fist against the inside of the roof. Out here, there were no lights but headlights. There was a quarter moon riding low under a brilliant field of stars. The only other flashes of light came from shrieking metal throwing sparks against the highway. Cars bounced and rolled and spun like matchbox run amok and the lead foot snaked between the onslaught of them all, making her car dance. She was an ace. But so was the gentleman. No one knew high-speed highway combat like he did. The roads, indeed, spoke to him. As Lurleen pulled right and surged forward, he waited for the tail of the carrier to start pulling left, and then he released the very last car. It missed the Trans Am, but hit right beside it, right where he was aiming. It landed on its roof and then spun sideways, sending its front end into her back end. The chase car skidded. She hit the brakes, swerved, and then ran into the dirt embankment, where soft earth and thin grass shredded under her wheels. The car slid like it was on thin ice. It came to a stop in a ditch, angled downward. Lefty pulled out her phone. Are you okay? she asked. Shh, Lurleen hissed at her. 
The driver had her eyes shut. She had one hand gripping the steering wheel, the other on the gear shift. She started to gently massage the gas pedal. Just a light touch. And she listened to the way the car breathed, the way it responded. She felt it through her fingertips. She smelled it. Finally, she was satisfied. The car was okay. Whatever damage they had taken was purely cosmetic, and the beast was still at full strength. Lurleen popped into reverse and eased out of the ditch and back up onto the blacktop. The CB radio crackled again. How y'all doing out there? Lurleen snatched up the handle, but Lefty gently plucked it from her hand. Drive, she said. The car surged forward. The car carrier had maybe two minutes' lead on him, which Lurleen could make up in half that time. Lefty, calmly, pouring on the accent as thick as molasses, finally answered the gentleman. We're good, Shug. Just needed to stop, check our makeup, you know, girl stuff. The gentleman laughed long and hard at that one. Well, for what it's worth, Lefty, I don't think you need it. Well, you're sweet as pie, aren't you? Now, is this the same man just tried to kill me? Kill you? Lefty looked over at Lurleen, who nodded and then held up her fingers in a pinching motion to indicate that, yes, maybe a little bit. She did get it. We'll all be seeing you real soon, Lefty said, as she saw lights in the road up ahead. But it wasn't the running lights of the car carrier. It was fire. Fire coming from the belly of the beast. The truck and trailer had both overturned and were laying on their sides, engulfed in flames. Lurleen came in slow, gave it a wide berth, and drove a lazy circle around the wreckage. They saw that the cab was full of fire. No one could have survived. Nothing moved. Nothing but the tendrils of flame that reached up for the stars and grabbed at the wind. Well, you might just see me again, and you might see me real soon, the gentleman responded. Lurleen kept circling, and she asked quietly, How the hell is he talking to us? They raced through the back roads, swooping past every little oasis of neon in the darkness. Every bar, every saloon, every tavern, every juke, every fish camp. Lefty was growling like her engine. I need a win tonight, Lefty. And then, barely shy of 2 a.m., she finally found what she had been searching for. A car that was maybe worth racing. She skidded sideways into the gravel parking lot of a tavern. 
left her engine idling, lights on high, and walked over to the best car that she had seen since crossing into this miserable state. And she kicked the side of it. Not enough to damage the car. Hell, vandalizing a vehicle on account of its beauty? That would be sacrilegious to Lurleen. But just hard enough to set off the alarm. It took two heartbeats before a monstrous Confederate beefcake came charging out of the bar. He was a beefy boy, thick, with a beer belly and 24-inch pythons, and a party-in-the-back-style mullet that even Lurleen had to admit was fucking magnificent. And she smiled at him, all nice and friendly, and said, Oh, is this piece of shit yours? Would you like a chance to see how a real car opens up? The gorilla stopped. Instantly, his rage turned to amusement. Here he was expecting trouble, and there was just this little West Virginia trash girl talking shit to him. Oh, you want to get opened up, huh? He was heavy breathing as he strolled towards her, popping those guns like some kind of Mississippi mating dance. Let's you and me race for pinks, little girl. And I don't mean... I know what you mean, asshole, she cut him off. It took him about a minute to wedge his massive bulk behind the wheel of his car, so Lurleen had time to change feet. You ain't gonna use your driving foot? Lefty asked. Nah, I don't need that for this gorilla. You're gonna beat him and then kick his ass afterwards, aren't you? Well, Lefty, this race isn't in question. But if I don't kick those little pink balls of his right into the back of the throat so deep he can taste them, then this ain't gonna be a W. The gorilla surged out of the lot, throwing gravel on her windshield and then whipped southbound on the two-lane. Lurleen calmly finished attaching her foot. She was in no hurry at all. And then she followed. Out of sportsmanship, the gorilla had waited, idling at about 20, waiting for her to get on the road. But once he saw her headlights, he started revving up. Lurleen pulled up next to him. She threw a middle finger right as he looked at her, and then they both opened throttle and shredded rubber. No jostling, no bump and grind, just pure speed. And that motherfucker stood no chance against Lurleen. She said, almost as an afterthought, you're a good shotgun, Lefty. Lefty didn't answer. She knew that when Lurleen was locked in on the road like this, it was like going to therapy inside a confessional. When that throttle opened up, so did Lurleen. So Lefty, listen. You ever notice that scar on my collarbone? That was from Janice. I went into a bar... Damn it, it was forever ago. I did that thing where I start a fight by unplugging the jukebox. This girl comes up to me, said that was her favorite song. And I told her that her favorite song sucked. And then she pulled out the cutest little boot knife that you ever saw. And she gave me that scar. God damn, I loved her. We were together a year or so, not long enough. Janice was my shotgun for, like, everything. And then she started pumping the brakes because 
the race was over. The gorilla was still trying to catch up, something that he didn't achieve until Erlene was parked crosswise over the yellow line of the road. Finally, break the tension, Lefty said. Shit. Maybe we should go back. Find that old lady from a few nights ago who beat the shit out of you. Y'all could be soulmates. Lurleen cocked her jaw. She almost laughed. Then she got distracted when the gorilla got out of his car and started stomping towards them. And he was snarling. You won, bitch. Okay, you won. I got your prize right here. And Lurleen was out. She was rounding the hood and charging him. You got it? Right where? The gorilla might have been expecting some resistance, but he was not expecting a prosthetic foot with titanium-coated lead bones and a steel plate on the toe to collide with his crotch with pinpoint accuracy. His legs went wobbly, and then his knee went out and he found himself kneeling on the road in front of her, wide open and exposed for that second and even more direct kick to the balls. The gorilla was now splayed out, laying on the road, gasping for breath. He pawed a cell phone out of the pocket of his jean shorts, and he dialed 911. Lefty got out of the car, and she said, wait for it. The channel has been blocked on authority of the Department of Restricted Operations. An agent will be contacting you soon. So what do you think, tough guy? You want to call your mama next? And they both laughed at him. He dropped the phone, and his eyes closed. When he opened them again, it was still dark. Girls were gone, and the sky was starting to turn golden around the edges. Slowly, he sat up. His, his nuts were throbbing like, holy shit, like bad, like let's go to the nut doctor bad. He struggled to get up, and then he heard someone say, You need a hand, partner? was a man in a long leather duster and a cowboy hat. He gently helped the gorilla to his feet. Thanks, mister. And the southern gentleman clapped his shoulder, very appreciative of the manners. Them two ladies done this to you. What would you say if I knew where they were right now? I'd say, let's go. Two hours later, just past dawn, they were at a dingy gas-and-go just outside of Tishomingo. They were both fueling up, Lurleen with premium, Lefty with black coffee. I could use a couple hours of shut-eye, Lurleen admitted. Lefty nodded. Yeah, I thought so. I'll stand watch while you rest, and then we switch. He's close, so we can't sit still for very long. They pulled away from the gas pumps and parked by the end of the building. Lurleen laid her seat back and closed her eyes. Lefty prowled the parking lot as she finished her coffee. She heard the car approaching before she saw it. And when she saw who it was, she drew her gun. 
the gorilla was back. He was driving towards Lefty, towards the gas pumps behind her, at full throttle overdrive, coming in hot at 75 miles an hour. Lefty only saw one figure in the car, and she saw that his hands had been zip-tied to the steering wheel. His muscle car was a missile. And she ran. She dove around the side of the building just before that missile hit the gas pumps and went up in a thunderclap of white heat. The force of the explosion knocked her over, stole her breath, filled her ears with cotton. By the time she regained her senses, got to her feet, and surveyed the damage to the place, Lurleen's car was already pulling onto the highway. As they drove past, the gentleman tipped his hat to Lefty. And then Lurleen caught her gaze and flicked her eyes back over her shoulder towards the gas station parking lot. Lefty tracked it and saw what Lurleen meant. There was one car in the lot that hadn't been damaged. A beat-up country pickup truck at the end of the lot, and it looked like it might still be drivable. I thank you for the ride, Miss Stokes. The southern gentleman was reclined in the shotgun seat leaning up against the door and turned just a little bit so that he could study the driver. He held no weapon. He made no attempt to touch Lurleen. More than that, there was something about him. The quality he exuded was very calming, soothing. It's no wonder so many people picked him up. He said, No seatbelts? Nah, I don't like them. What happens if you crash? Mister, you don't know how to crash right? Then you don't really know how to drive, do you? The gentleman chuckled. He slid his hat back on his head. I do enjoy your company, Miss Stokes. So you know who I am. It's hard not to, a reputation like yours. I tell you, I remember old Earl Joe. He was a son of a bitch. Pardon my language. Lurleen agreed. That he was. She touched the scar on her collar. So what happens now, she asked him. You gonna stab me? You gonna grab the wheel? You gonna use vampire hoodoo witchcraft on me? No, ma'am. Time being, I'm just enjoying the drive. The tires hummed. Lurleen sat down on the accelerator and the needle jumped up over a hundred. The gentleman looked out the window. Lurleen scratched the back of her ankle. Are you going to die today, Miss Stokes? She edged the needle just a little higher. Her hair was dancing around the edges of her face. She said, Lord only knows. When the time comes... I'll die behind the wheel. Of that, I am sure. Anything else? I couldn't say. Do you believe in the Lord? She shrugged, not particularly. But if he is real, then it don't matter if I believe or not. Kind of the same thing as with you. Cars honked and swerved as Lurleen bounced back and forth across the double yellow. At this time of morning, traffic was thin, but the drivers got riled up like hornets as she roared past them. 
Lefty's my shotgun. That's uh, her seat you're in right now. She thinks you want to die. Me? I think you're in it for the kicks. I think it gets you high. And I know because it gets me high. And then she slammed on the brakes, leaving black skids for 20 yards before sliding to a stop. There was a knife in his hand now. She laughed. Do you want to get high? And then she dropped into reverse. She watched the road coming on in the rear view as she came charging back on those same angry hornets she had just riled up. The Trans Am swerved back and forth, sliding around the other cars effortlessly. The gentleman kept that knife by his leg. Let's say that we both die today, she said. She scratched the back of her ankle. That's up to you, Miss Stokes, he replied. And he gripped up tighter on the knife, inching towards her. Lurleen caught a glimpse of a familiar vehicle coming up behind her. It wasn't moving fast, but it was moving as fast as it could. There was about 30 seconds until it was right up on her. What do you want, Miss Stokes? The gentleman asked. She thought about it, gauged the time in her head, and said, I want a fucking fight. She plucked the three-inch boot knife from the back of her drinking foot, and she stabbed it through his wrist and into his thigh, pinning his arm. His hand spasmed, and he dropped the knife. And then Lurleen threw a back elbow into his nose. The gentleman reached out with his other hand, and he raked at her eyes. She blinked the blur away and saw that run-down pickup truck from the gas station was almost right on top of them. She yanked the knife out of the gentleman's arm and then stabbed him with it in the chest. She pulled the wheel, grabbed the panic bar overhead, and held fast. The wheels the Trans Am cut just a hair, but at this high speed, it was enough to send the car into a spin. Lurleen had timed it just right, and the car spun halfway around before getting T-boned by Lefty's truck. Gentleman sighed first, of course, and he took the full impact. Darkness few seconds of quiet, and then the twisted steel began to settle, and Chip's broken glass plinked against the blacktop. Cars were gathering on either side of the wreck. Lefty emerged from the damaged pickup, gun in hand. She pulled Lurleen from the wreckage. The driver was cut, bruised, Shoulder dislocated, foot gone, maybe lost forever. But she was sweating and panting like she just got laid. At a girl, Lefty said. Then she dragged the gentleman out of the wreck by his hair and cuffed him face down in the leaking oil on the road. Lurleen was in no condition to help. But Lefty didn't need help. She knelt on the killer's back with the barrel of her sidearm against the back of his head. And they stayed that way until an unmarked DRO armored transport showed up. The security detail was a dozen agents in field combat gear. 
They had been tracking Lurleen's car, just the same as Lefty had been. The gentleman was rapidly shackled, bagged, and locked in a cage in the back of the vehicle. Lefty knelt down by Lurleen and popped her shoulder back into place. There you go, none the worse for wear. What now? Lurleen asked. She was staring with mourning at her car. Now? I'm taking the son of a bitch to a special loony bin made for people like him. It's up in North Michigan. She hitched her thumb at the transport. You ever drive one of these before? Lurleen said, I can't say that I have. Would you like to? Lefty took Lurleen by the hand, pulled her to her foot. All right, then. Thank you for listening to another episode of a Scary Home Companion. Was it just me, or did you fall in love with Lurleen a little bit? I know she's out of my league and all, but what a firecracker. You can hear more about Leadfoot Lurleen Stokes in Hellbound and Down which is one of my personal favorite episodes of the show. Lefty, you may remember from The Thing in the Basement and The Massacre at Black Site 1. If you'd like to find out what happens next to the Southern Gentleman, listen to Night of the Long Knives. Interact with the show on social media. We're on Twitter, Insta, and the devil's cock that we all love to suck, Facebook. Or email me directly at a scary home companion at gmail.com. Support the show on Patreon. I would appreciate it. You find bonus material, exclusive minisodes, early episode releases, and post-mortem episode analysis videos, and more. Join Kevin, Monica, Andy, Eric, Ashley, Sean, Karen, Nick, Joseph, Amy, Buck, Matthew, and Carol as patrons. For the first time, maybe you can find a little shred of happiness in the raging hellscape that we call life. The episode was produced and edited by Jeff Davidson. Guest appearance by Eric Taylor as the voice of the DRO. Featured music by Lobo Loco, Place of Nowhere. The legendary Shack Shakers with Pine Top Boogie. Break the Bands with Gay Bar, Alpha Jaguar with their self-titled song. Devil Music. The Chase, Triple Hex with Phantom Highway 13, and as always, Chelsea Oxendine with the theme music.